Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. I'll give you a chance to find that now. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Hear now God's word. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, mate. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, welcome, if you're, especially if you're new, welcome uh, to the service. Uh, I'm Sam, one of the pastors here, and, and so I'm going to preach from that text that was just read. Um, let's, let me pray, and then we'll get into it. Well, Heavenly Father, as we come now to what really is the pinnacle of our worship, where we hear from you, having your word read, and now pray that you would help me to be faithful to it, that, that the things I would say would be true. And Father, ultimately, even in a passage like this, that you would show us the Lord Jesus, that would be enough for us today, forever. And so we pray, without your Spirit's help right now, nothing of great importance or value or impact can possibly happen. And so we pray for the Spirit's help now in the preaching and the hearing of your word. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, if you're here last week, you know that, we, well, we've been going through 1 Thessalonians. You don't have to be here last week for that. That's been a while. But last week, we began a new section in the book of 1 Thessalonians, marked out by the very first two words of chapter 4. Keep your Bibles open. Have a look. Finally, then. Not necessarily wrapping up the letter. Two chapters to go. However, it is coming to a new section, the final section of the letter, which is, what we said, was more of a, an emphasis on application. The emphasis is on, like, holy living. So Paul often does this in his letters. He has a kind of structure where he moves from beginning with thanksgiving for a church, doctrines of God, great doctrines of the gospel, our salvation of, by grace through faith alone. And then he'll move in the second parts of, of letters to areas of application, of holy living. And that is the dynamics of the gospel, isn't it? That, that our response to the gospel is holy living. We don't live in a certain way so that we might earn the salvation and earn grace from God, but actually grace comes first, God works in our lives, and, and then the life that we live there for is a response to the work that He's done in our lives. We have received a wonderful gospel, and we want to adorn that gospel with lives that reflect the goodness of it. So Paul writes in, in, in verse 3, he says, look at that, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's His will for you. Your ongoing conformity to the image of God, growth in holiness, dying to sin and living to righteousness by the help of the Holy Spirit. And Paul's first thought under that heading, we're talking about self sanctification now, your life, what's it going to look like? The first area that he wanted to zero in on, we looked at last week, was the words abstain from sexual immorality. Well, where to now? Well, we don't have to wait long before tell, Paul tells us what the next topic is. Do you see verse 9 begins? Now, concerning brotherly love. So we move from sexual immorality to brotherly love. Now, those are two different things, aren't they? But in many ways, they're kind of connected, aren't they? They're to do with our relationships with other people. They're in some senses connected with love for other people. Sexual immorality, of course, is that distortion of God's design, marked by, well, what did we see last week? Unholiness, unrighteousness, disregard for God. 
on account of which the Lord Jesus is going to return as an avenger. But now we turn to brotherly love, which of course pleases the Lord, which doesn't do harm to people, but actually does good to people. That is full of holiness and honor. And so we look now to brotherly love. Paul puts side by side purity and love. And these were two kind of marks of the early church, which really made them stand out in the ancient world, wasn't it? Purity and love. But the ancient world was impure. It was promiscuous. It was full of sexual immorality. And it was a brutal world. It was an abusive world. And Paul says, no, for the Christians, they're going to live like this. They're going to be both pure and loving. So look back now as well as at the end of chapter 3, two things that Paul prayed for. Remember, and that was the kind of like a pivot in the, in the letter, moving us into the application section. And so Paul prayed this for them. He said in, in chapter 3, verse 11, he says, May the Lord make you increase, notice, and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish our heart, your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So he prayed for the two things that we just taught on, right? Holiness and love. And he, goes, he prays for holiness, prays for love. And now he teaches on purity, holiness, and love. I think that's a very helpful thing to notice that, and, and just see that Paul's dynamic in that. What he prays for, he works for, right? He doesn't... He doesn't um, just go for it himself. There's no, there's no self-reliance here. I don't need to pray. I'll just, you know, I, I've got the giftings and I've got the intellect and I can just kind of accomplish the things that I think need to be accomplished. And so I'll just go for it. No, he prays. Because without prayer, he can just talk to the cows. Go home. Unless the Spirit works, none of it's of any value or impact. But then having prayed, he doesn't just sit back and do nothing. He prays and then he teaches. He prays and then he acts. Martin Luther responded when asked what he had to do that day. He once said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Isn't that good? I'll pray and act. And so our passage, the structure for the passage is this. We have a structure. How good is that? First, Paul describes the present state of their brotherly love. Second, the future of their brotherly love. And third, the purpose of their brotherly love, okay? So first of all, what is the state of their brotherly love? You know, in America, if you know those kind of um, politics over there, they have the state of the union, and they go, here's where things are at right now in our country. And everyone, you know, if you're, if you're on the good, you know, the team that's happy for that, you clap, and if you're not, you boo and whatever. Anyway, don't boo. But Paul's saying, here's the state of the church right now. Here's the state of your love, Thessalonians. Verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. I love that. Isn't that good? He writes to them about how no one needs to write to them about this. Right? It's like, I'm going to write to you about love, a thing in which you actually need nobody at all to write to you about. Because how does he, how does he describe their love? First of all, he says it's brotherly love. The Greek word is Philadelphia. That's why that city is called the city of brotherly love. Love. What's radical about this is Paul is using that term, brotherly love, for a group of people who are not actually blood relatives. And that is not how anyone ever used that word in the ancient world. That, you know, you love your family in a particular way. No one else gets that kind of love. And Paul talks to a church full of, you know, I mean, look around. There's strange people, you know, with different people, right? from all different kinds of ages, stages, backgrounds. And he goes, brotherly love, family love. You go, what? For all of this, for us, for all the people in Thessalonica? Thessalonica? But that's what happened. You know, as people became Christians, they began to like look at each other differently and go, you know, maybe they were friends before. You know, they had stuff in common. They both, you know, they love chariot racing and they, they were like, Let's, we love doing that together. We're friends. We've got that stuff in common. But then maybe they became Christians, and it was like, we're not actually just friends anymore. You're like my brother. You're my sister. Because the thing that we have in common now is not just kind of a common interest. We have a common father. We've been adopted into God's family. 
So I'm the youngest of four boys, so I've got three brothers. The main reason I call them brothers is because we have the same parents, right? That's actually the only reason. That's the, oh, oh, well, that's the main thing, right? But then I also come into church here, and I go, brothers, sisters. Why? Well, because we have the same father. We've been adopted into the same family, and so because of that, our love takes on a family shape. Romans 12.10, love one another with brotherly affection. Hebrews 13.1, let brotherly love continue. 1 Peter 1.22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. We could go on and on and on, but is that, is that, just, just test your heart right now, is that, the lens by which I see everyone else, my brothers and sisters, the other members in this church, do I see them in terms of family love from an earnest heart? That's what we're commanded. What is it about people here that draws out your affection? Is it when you find somebody who's like the same age group as you and you go, yes, oh, that's natural, that's good, that's natural. It was when you find someone here and you're like, oh, you're, you're, you're interested in the same things as me. That's very natural, very normal, nothing wrong with that. Or you find, out, find someone, they have the same background as you. You're like, we, 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 you're from there, I'm from there too. And you're drawn, like, love's drawn out and that's perfectly natural, perfectly normal, nothing wrong with that. But when you find someone who you actually have not much in common with at all, but you go, oh, you've been... You've been foreknown, predestined, called, justified, loved, adopted by God. Me too. That's not natural. That's supernatural. And that's what God does in His church. We become part of the same family. And so Paul says, Paul calls their love brotherly love. Notice what he also says about their love. He says it is God taught. That's why he says, you actually don't need anyone to write this letter, right there, the letter that I'm actually writing. You actually need anyone to do that because you don't need, you've already been taught. You, it's not like I'm the only teacher going on in this church. You have another teacher. It's actually a very, very good teacher. He says, you have been taught by God to love one another. And it says Paul has actually invented a word for this. It's, he's kind of mushed together God and taught. And so it's theodidactoi. And it's, it's, it's God taught. You have, you're a church who is God taught. So Paul left them, and he had to leave them, remember, after a very short time. He only got a few weeks with them. And he had to leave them, but they weren't left without a teacher. They had the Holy Spirit given to them at their conversion, and the Holy Spirit had a teaching ministry in that church. And it seems like the focus of the, the teaching ministry in that church was love. Does that surprise us? That the Holy Spirit would be about teaching love? I don't think so. How's the fruit of the Spirit begin? Love. Jesus said, will know you, the world will know you are my disciples by your love. Paul talks about in 1, 1 Corinthians 13 that, you know, without love, I mean, you can do all kinds of things. You can do the most sacrificial things in the world. You can do the most miraculous things in the world. You can have this kind of crazy faith that achieves so much. And if you, you're missing this thing, love, you're nothing. And everything you're doing is nothing. He also say that love fulfills God's law. Romans 13 verse 8. Listen to these words. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you think about the Ten Commandments, maybe you just maybe didn't notice it. None of them are about how you think about yourself. They are all about love. The first four, love for God. Then the six about love for neighbor. 1 John 3, 14, these are striking words. He says, we know that we have passed out of death into life. How? Because we love the brothers. Who does, whoever does not love abides in death. 
And so you can imagine, Paul hears the report back from, because he sends Timothy to go find out how is this church going. He comes back and he goes, oh my goodness, you should see their love for one another. And Paul goes, man, I don't even need to write about it. God has been teaching them to love one another. All right, then verse 10 adds this to the state of their love. He says, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So their God-taught brotherly love is, is so full, there's no kind of lid on it. It's like, that's just for our community and we, we're like super tight and super loving. It's just that the lid is off and it is overflowing to all of the saints throughout all of Macedonia. When they see another brother and they see another sister, they're like, oh my goodness. What an awesome, t- we don't, we're not told what that actually looked like, but what an awesome reputation. Oh, that would be our reputation. We love all the saints. We love all our brothers and sisters. So that's the state of their love, okay? Sounds pretty good. What next? Well, Paul has four things about the future of their brotherly love. First thing is this, do it more. Right, do you see that? End of verse 10. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. So he's passionate, he's pleading. I'm urging you, do not stop. Do not pause. Do not loiter. When it comes to love, the great missionary David Brainerd wrote this. He said, I love to live on the brink of eternity. May I never loiter in my heavenly journey. Because, of course, if, if it, when it comes to like love and loving for one another, if we begin to like coast, what happens to love? Well, it grows cold. And so here we are. Here we are, Kumar Baptist. We've been in this series for a little while, and, and, and it's been an encouraging series. I hope it has been for you, because at various different times, we've been able to look at what Paul's thankful for in, in, in the church in Thessalonica, and, and at various times, I know I have said, praise God, I'm thankful for the same thing here. There, there's, 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 there are amazing, extraordinary acts of love, ordinary as well, but just love in this church. I'm so thankful for, to God for that. It's so encouraging. Now, don't stop. Paul would say, now do it more and more. How quickly love, how quickly we can lose love. How quickly we can become selfish. How quickly we can become consumeristic. How quickly we can become competitive. How quickly we can become gossips, busybodies. No, let's keep going. And so now, Paul turns and he gives three aspirations for you to make for your life that will enable abounding love, more and more love. See how verse 11 begins? It says, and aspire to, NIV has, make it your ambition, NLT has, make it your goal. So we are talking about goals and ambitions this morning, okay? You didn't expect that, did you? But just consider me your life coach right now, and I'm going to give you some goals and ambitions for your life. This is just a sweet spot for me. No, it's not really. Um, Paul wants a primary consideration when you think about goals and ambitions for your life. He wants a primary consideration to be brotherly love. In our culture, we're like, ah, okay, you don't understand what goals and ambitions are about, Paul. You don't really understand. They're actually all about me. They're about me and my dreams. Out of me and my hopes and, and ambitions, and then I, w- I want to achieve this, and I want to do this, and I want to kind of leave my mark on the world. And, and so that, that actually the main thing when it comes to laying out my goals and ambitions for my life is actually to forget about other people. They're going to get in the way. I don't care. You need to not think about what they think. Put them to the side and consider what, what do you want. I remember um, thinking about this. I remember a kid's movie that... Um, I forgot to mention this to him. Sienna and um, Jada used to watch this movie. I was going to check with them, but we're good. And um, <laughs> anyway, Sienna, it was Sienna's 10th birthday party, and um, they, they love this movie called The Princess Protection Program. Does anyone know that movie? All right, if you haven't seen it, don't rush. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, not like, it's not what I would call a must-see. But it, um, but it is an interesting movie about a princess needing protection. Um, now... 
It was Sienna's 10th birthday party, and lots of friends were over, and so the movie got put on. And, and so there it begins, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really in the room, I'm more in the kitchen, but I can hear the movie. And as the movie begins, a song starts playing, and the song goes like this. Do what you want to do. Be what you want to be. A line I can't understand. Then, there's no mystery. Say what you want to say. Tomorrow's another day. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> Poetry. But here's the news, nobody's stopping you. Do what you want to do. And I could hear it, and I was triggered. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I just popped my head into the room and said, loudly, that song has bad ideas. <laughs> and then left it at that. Just dr drop that seed, see if it grows. Okay? That was like seven years ago. You should check in, see if they remember that. Theologian Michael Horton wrote a, a great book called Ordinary. He makes the point that actually the word ambition, up until recently, was only ever considered to be actually be a negative word. It's not something you would encourage in somebody. Because it was tied so closely to self, me, what I want to do. And I will trample other people to get what I want. And so you'd never encourage it in somebody. That's why um, it's in, in many... Um, newer translations of the Bible, when it comes, when, when ambition comes up as a topic, they'll always add in the extra kind of modifier at the start, selfish ambition. Just so the modern mind can get their head around, oh, ambition could be a bad thing. But, but in older translation, it just says ambition. And so the New Testament often puts selfish ambition as the opposite of love, the opposite of brotherly love. I think of Philippians 2 verse 3, which says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition and conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. You see, like, selfish, like ambition is like conceit, pride. You just think, I'm, I'm more significant than everybody else. That's what ambition means. But instead, don't do that, but consider other people more significant than yourself, Paul says. Um, it's what's, what's uh, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, it's been going around a little bit like recently, main character syndrome. Have you heard of this? Main character syndrome. It's where if someone might go through, the, through their life thinking, well, if my life is a movie, I really am the main character of this movie and I'm the star of the show and everyone else is kind of bit part role actors and they've just, they're actually very lucky to be in my movie and, and they should thank me pretty often for actually the privilege of being part of my show. We look at the Bible, how does ambition go? You might say Satan had ambition, he just had ambition. He wanted more than just being an angel serving the Lord. Adam and Eve you might go, just a couple people with some ambition in their lives, they just wanted some more, you know, they wanted to get higher. Did that result in brotherly love? No, they turn on each other. We think about that other great moment of ambition where everybody got together and said, let's build a tower. That's, it, it, what great ambition you all have. Let's build a tower to heaven. Did that result in brotherly love? No, only division. So when Paul comes to, in 1 Thessalonians, and he starts saying, aspire to this. Make this your ambition. Make this your goals. You go, huh? What do you mean? Aren't we, aren't we, weren't we just talking about brotherly love in the church and now you're saying, have ambition? And Paul might say, hear me out. Let me tell you what those ambitions are. Verse 11, aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. Are you inspired? You're going to put that in your office, aren't you, with the big thing, you know, the, what are they, those things? <laughs> you know, the big pictures with the inspirational fighter jet? Live quietly. <laughs> you know. Mind your own business. Let's go through them. First, aspire, Paul says, to live quietly. I think it's meant to be ironic. I think he's meaning it to be ironic. Have ambition. You're like, what? Have ambition, to not have ambition. Oh, you got me. 
Well done. Aspire to actually not have much aspiration. What does it mean to live quietly? Obviously, it doesn't mean about God, about the gospel. (laughs) I mean, Paul, that would take some hypocrisy. No, he should be as loud as anything about the Lord, loud as anything about the gospel. But you know what Paul was quiet about and he tried to be as quiet as he could about? Himself. And sometimes he does have to defend himself and he hates it. He's like, I feel like a fool. I hate doing this. I'd rather boast in my weakness. Do you live quietly when it comes to the things about you? Social media is obviously a slow moving target when it comes to this. Are you living quietly? You know, social media began and, and um, you know, there's MySpace. I don't know if you remember that. But it really triggered something where, where you become the product, where you're the brand. And it's putting myself out there. And so when that's the case, you best be loud and proud. That's how it works. That's how you get the attention. I hope this isn't controversial, but I don't think this song is a biblical song. I got the eye of the tiger, a fighter, dancing through the fire, because I am a champion, and you're going to hear me roar louder, louder than a lion, because I am a champion, and you're going to hear me roar. Me, I, louder. Now, I honestly think, while pointing the finger, I think pastors and churches, as, as I was thinking about this, can fall into this culture. And, and I'm sure I have. Look what I'm doing. And, you know, it's almost like a, a brother can't, maybe he just can't do anything unless it's told to everyone. You know, and I did this over here, and I did this over here, and I've been speaking over here, and I've, I actually went over here. And did I really do the thing unless I told everybody that I did the thing? And then when it comes to my church, let me tell you about it. It's epic. It's huge. It's breakthrough stuff. It's once in a lifetime things. We are movement leaders of leaders of leaders, and we are ch- system changers of all kinds. And you really don't want to miss a single, well, particularly this Sunday, because it's going to be particularly breakthrough epic. <laughs> I was messaging um, <laughs> with a couple of friends. I hope this is not self indulgent. I was messaging with a couple of friends. One's a pastor, and one's just a, a, another good mate. And our challenge in our messages was to. Um, was to speak in as many of the latest kind of church leadership buzzwords as we possibly could. And it kind of went a bit like this, just a brief. So I said to my friend, my friend, you are an influencing catalytic leader of movements for creative minority cultural engagement. And he responded, I need to take a deep dive into this touch point. The hope, the hyper-local synergy that is manifesting within this space is countercultural. And then the other friend said, if I can raise my view above the tree line and look down over the forest... I have a vision of a leader of leaders that is influencing the next generation of kingdom leaders of leaders that is going to saturate the forest like Mountain Dew, manifesting with missional incarnation. (laughs) And on and on, it went for way too long. (laughs) I don't know if you've seen um, the Lego movies, um, but there's a transition that happens. So in the first Lego movie, you got Emmett, and like everything is awesome. I think that that like... That's how we like, can be brought up into that culture. It's like, everything is just awesome. It's awesome. How's this? Awesome. You walked in this morning, someone said, how? Awesome. But then they like correct it in the second movie. Do you remember at the end of the second movie, they have another song, and it goes like this, and I like it. Everything's not awesome. <laughs> Things can't be awesome all the time. <laughs> it's an unrealistic expectation. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make everything awesome just in a less idealistic kind of way. We should maybe aim for not bad. Because not bad, well, that would be real great. I'd love to promote a Sunday service, more like the second song. This Sunday, it's going to be a lot like last Sunday, if for, for, and the one before that. <laughs> They're all pretty similar. 
We'll get together with God's people and we will sing and we will read God's word. We'll pray. God's word will be preached, the Lord's Supper. And uh, we'll go home. And those are ordinary things. But here's what we think. God will show up. In all those ordinary things, God will show up. What is our membership in a church for? Is it to express brotherly love? Or is membership in a church about ambition? Michael Horton writes, he says, Contra the wisdom of this age, Paul tells us that the body of Christ is not just a voluntary association for realizing my dream of belonging or a place where I can assert my unique abilities. Christ's body is not a stage for my performance, but an organism into which I've been inserted by the Spirit by a miracle of grace. So come and aspire to live quietly at Coomera Baptist. What would that look like? Well, Romans 14, 19, maybe. Let us pursue what, ta- what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Romans 15, verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and to not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Romans 12.10, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Okay, so you want competition, here's a competition for you. You can outdo one another, how? Showing honor. So let's be loud for Christ, even loud for others, but let's be very quiet about ourselves, almost a whisper about our own goodness and achievements and You know, when Paul writes uh, to the Philippians and he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also also to the interests of others. Who's his example straight after that of what that looks like? It's the Lord Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, Being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Be like Christ. Lowliness, humility. All right, there's your life ambition number one. All right, I've got another one for you. Paul does. Life ambition number two, aspire to mind your own affairs. Now, I'm actually thinking about this. I was like, I'm nervous that we walk away with the wrong idea. There are ways that we should be about each other's business and in each other's affairs. I, we just read Philippians 2 verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Just later on in 1 Thessalonians, Paul's going to write this. He says, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So Paul can't be contradicting himself right now, commanding something that he's going to kind of contradict later on and say, no, actually, be about other people's business. But there's a way of getting involved in other people's lives which is actually not brotherly love. It's actually self-centered. It's all about you. In 1 Timothy 5.13, he warns of people who learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips, busybodies, saying what they should not. They're in other people's affairs, but it's more meddling, and it's being a busybody. It's a big issue in in the second letter that Paul will write to the church in Thessalonica. He says, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 11, And we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Because instead of being busy at work, you're being busy bodies. You're getting all in other people's business, and it's not out of love. You might not say it like that. You would say, no, I'm just concerned, right? I'm just looking for more prayer points so I can be praying. But no, you just actually enjoy drama. You enjoy stirring. 
You enjoy being in the know and spreading things. You're in other people's affairs. You should be worried about your own affairs, Paul says. Make this your ambition and your aspiration in your life to mind your own affairs. It's so much easier to look at other people's problems, isn't it, than your own? Isn't it? Isn't it so much easier to go, I, just, I know how to fix their problems than fix your own problems? It's easier, like, it's easier to have, put it there, it's easier to have opinions about Donald Trump than to do the dishes. Don't you find? I do. <laughs> Kevin DeYoung once tweeted, he said, everyone wants to change the world, change a diaper first. Um, the author, Tish Harrison uh, Warren, uh, wrote, uh, pretty profoundly, I think, about her own story. She wrote about her desire in her early 20s to be a kind of change-the-world Christian. And she, and she did amazing things. She went overseas and, 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 did, and did good things around the world. But then she writes about it, and, it's, and I'm going to read it. There's a little bit to read, so, but it's, it's, it's excellent stuff. She says this, But now I'm 30-something with two kids living a more or less ordinary life. And what I'm slowly realizing is that for me, being in the house all day with a baby and two-year-old is a lot more scary and a lot harder than being in a war-torn African village. What I need courage for is the ordinary, the everydayness of life. Caring for a homeless, kid is, a homeless kid is a lot more thrilling to me than listening well to the people in my home. Giving away clothes and seeking out edgy Christian communities requires less of me than being kind to my husband on an average Wednesday morning or calling my mother back when I don't feel like it. My life is really rich in dirty clothes, dirty dishes and diapers these days, and really short in revolutions. I go to a church full of older people who live pretty normal, middle-class lives in nice middle-class houses. But I've really come to appreciate this community to see their lifetimes of sturdy faithfulness to Jesus, their commitment to prayer, and the tangible, beautiful generosity that they show those around them in unnoticed, unimpressive, unmarketable, unrevolutionary ways. And each week, we average sinners and boring saints gather around ordinary bread and wine, and Christ himself is there with us. And so this is what I need now, she writes, the courage to face an ordinary day. An afternoon with, my, with a colicky baby when I'm probably going to snap at my two-year-old and get annoyed with my noisy neighbor without despair. The bravery it takes to believe that a small life is still a meaningful life. And the grace to know that even when I've done nothing that is powerful or bold or even interesting, that the Lord notices me and is fond of me and that that is enough. So don't miss here. Don't miss here what, 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 what's being said. The one who's writing this to mind your own affairs is the Apostle Paul. He did travel the world planting churches. This is not opposed to that. But actually, the, the testing ground to go and do those things is, are you mindful of your own affairs? You know, so that to become an elder, one of the qualifications is, do you manage your household well? Are you minding your own affairs? How on earth will you be able to manage the affairs of the household of God if you're not minding your own affairs? And so he says that. Are you often looking at what other people are up to? Looking into other people's affairs? Seeing what they have, they own that, they wear that, they just bought that, they went on that holiday. Well, maybe they should be quieter about their lives. And you should mind your own affairs and be content with them. That would actually be brotherly love. So that's ambition number two. Ambition for your life number three. Aspire to work with your hands. Now, I don't think that means everyone must go and get a trade this week. You may be nervous about that. It's like, well, typing is with hands, so, you know. Yeah, okay, you can keep typing, that's fine. I think Paul's saying... Paul's saying, notice what he's saying. He's saying, I think he's basically just saying, have ambition to work. Like, want to work. And, and it, it's so strange in our culture, isn't it? It's like, he didn't just say, have aspirations for your dream job, you know, like, th th that'll just kind of fulfill all of your dreams and make, you know, if you can, by all means, go for it. 
But mainly you're just like, I just want to work. I want to put my hands to work. That's brotherly love. That's, that's providing for, 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 for your family. It's providing for yourself. Lord willing, providing for others. Paul deals with this again in the next letter that he writes them as well. So 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. You know, that's pretty extreme, right? But they'll get the picture pretty quickly, right? I think he's, 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 he's banking on, they'll get it. By about dinner time, they're going to start working. There you go, you're not willing to work? Okay, no more food. Well, we'll see how long that lasts. So it's an expression of brotherly love to work and to work hard. So now that's the three aspirations for your life, three ambitions for your life. I hope you feel inspired by those goals. Now, two reasons why you have those three. Paul gives them. First is our witness to the world. Do you see that? Verse 12, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. So we do those things and we live in this way because it's about our reputation in the world. The ambitions that you make for your life is part of your witness to the watching world. So that our world, which is, I mean, let's, let's face it, a confused world, a lost world, a, a, a searching for meaning world, probably just so sick of hype. Everything is so hyped and everyone is so, look at me and look at me and look at me and look at this and you've got to be part of this. And they're just exhausted by it all. And maybe the, that person walks into the church and goes, I hope there's something different. And if they poke their head in and go, oh man, more hype, more self, look at me, and they'll just walk straight out. You don't have anything to offer. What do we have to offer? What is the proper way, Paul says, Paul says, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. What is the proper way for a Christian to walk? A Christian, what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who's been saved by the grace and the mercy of God, not by performance, not by their kind of stellar resume of achievements. They've been loved by God despite their sin. And they've been included and accepted by Him, adopted into His family. They are heirs with Christ with riches in heaven for all of eternity. They have stopped needing to be loud about themselves. They are able to mind their own affairs. See, a gospel like that, a gospel of grace, cannot possibly be adorned by self-promotion. Those things just obviously don't go together. No, they are adorned, though, that such a gospel would be adorned by brotherly love. It would be adorned by quiet, faithful lives, minding the ordinary affairs of our lives and working hard. Those are good members of a church, but they happen to also be great members of society. And the world might look at that and go, hmm, there's something on offer here. I would like to know what makes the difference. There's an article, you know The Onion? Um, the Onion's like a satire news online thing. There was an article that, that ran, um, so this is fake, right? it's not real, uh, but it kind of gets to this point of the reputation towards outsiders. It says, it says this, I'll just read some of it. It says, long-time acquaintance confirmed to reporters this week that local man Michael Husma, an unambitious 29-year-old loser who leads, an un who leads an enjoyable and fulfilling life, still lives in his hometown and has no desire to leave claiming that the aimless slouch has never resided more than two hours from his parents and still hangs out with his friends from high school. Sources close to Husma reported that the man who has meaningful, lasting personal relationships and a healthy work-life balance is an unmotivated washout, who's perfectly comfortable being a nobody for the rest of his life. I've known Mike my whole life and he's a good guy, but it's pretty pathetic that he's still living in the same street he grew up on and, and experiencing a deep sense of personal satisfaction childhood friend David Gorman said of the uninspiring, completely gratified do-nothing. He's nearly 30 years old, living in the exact same town he was born in, working at the same, so the same small-time job, and is extremely contented in all aspects of his home and professional life. It's really sad. 
Additionally, pointing to the intimate, enduring connections he's developed with his wife, parents, siblings, and neighbors, sources reported that husband's life is pretty humiliating on multiple levels. He doesn't care about impressing total strangers every day as he climbs the corporate ladder when he can invest in the lives of those closest to him. He doesn't have a thousand friends on Facebook, just a close family and circle of friends in town. Quote, I'm just glad I got out of there and didn't end up like Mike, said Husmer's cousin. The last thing I'd ever want is to have a loving family nearby, live, feeling a sense of pleasure when reflecting on my life and be the big failure that everyone runs into when they visit home once a year for the holidays. You see what I'm saying? Saying, the world might watch and go, actually, that sounds like a pretty good life. That sounds pretty good. So then the second purpose of their love, outsiders, but then, and be dependent on no one. See, part of why you work, and why working is a loving thing to do, is that you don't depend on people. So if you can work, you should work. And if you can't work, it is the blessing of the church to come around and to help. John Stott writes, he says, it is an expression of love to support those who are in need, but it is also an expression of love to support ourselves, so as not to need to be supported by others. So that's our passage. What we're talking about is ambitions for your life this morning, goal setting. Brotherly, family, Christian love means quiet, humble lives, minding our own affairs, working hard to provide for ourselves, provide for others. I wonder if that's enough for your life. You're like, I'm not sure that's enough. I hope it is. I think it can only be so in our day through the gospel, surely. That already the verdict on my life has been made. God has said, you are righteous. God has said, he loves you. God has said, you're accepted into my family. God has said, you have an eternity waiting for you. So don't feel like you've got to build up yourself. I don't think this is about living a mediocre life, not doing anything well. We try to do things well. But they're very ordinary things, aren't they? And that's how revivals have happened throughout the history of the church. God has taken ordinary things like prayer, preaching, evangelism, and just given extraordinary grace on those things. And so God uses ordinary things. Don't, don't get disheartened. You might have sat through this morning and thought, what is happening here? This seems very ordinary. <laughs> what has happened here this morning? Uh, honestly, not that spectacular. If we went through it, we don't need to. You were here. But let's be real. But God is here. And what's He been doing? By His grace, He might be drawing and justifying sinners sanctifying our hearts, changing our affections for the things of the world to Him, getting us ready for the return of the Lord Jesus, unifying His people. Awesome things. Amazing things. And the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, smallest of all seeds, but it grows steadily, but it grows. And it fills the whole world. So brothers and sisters, live quietly, Mind your own affairs, work hard, because you've got nothing to prove, and this loves both the world, but it also loves each other. Let me pray.